Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Jazakumullah khid for joining us today. Um, feel free to have your webcams on, inshallah. We're hoping for this to be as interactive as possible. And so before we begin, I plan to introduce the event, our uh, amazing speaker, inshallah, and then we'll go into a presentation and then we'll have an open Q&A. For the Q&A, you're more than welcome to either unmute and ask via your mic, or you can send a message to myself and I'll read it aloud to Sister Da, inshallah. And so before we get started, um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Wafa. I'm the current director of education for the Institute of Muslim Mental Health. Um, and I want to welcome you all to today's event. Alhamdulillah, we're super excited um, for this month's Meet the Expert webinar. Um, and as you all know, for this month, the webinar is co-hosted with the Family and Youth Institute, otherwise known as the FYI, which is another organization that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and so just a little bit about the FYI, um, it is an organization that has been around for about 10 years. Um, and the first phase of the organization was mostly focused on um, issues and trends in the American Muslim community. And you can actually find a lot of the projects and studies on the website, um, the FYI.org. Um, and the FYI is currently still continuing to do um, work that's focused on Muslim youth and terbiyah. And so today's webinar, as you all know, is entitled Empower, Connect, and Support Best Practices for Facilitating Healing Circles. And our speaker today is Sister Da Hajjaj. And so given the recent events that have been occurring in Philistine, we figured that um, since we all, a lot of us are in positions where we're either having to facilitate healing circles for our communities or our loved ones, our friends, or just be there for other people, um, you know, it's an amana that we're entrusted with. And so it's our responsibility to be able to provide that care um, with excellence. And so what better way to do so than, um, than learning about how to do so. And so just a little bit about our speaker, um, Sister Da'a Hajjaj is a licensed professional counselor. She's also a community educator with the Family and Youth Institute. She holds a master's degree in counseling with a dual certificate in school and community counseling. She currently works in private practice as a child, adolescent, and family therapist at Silent Sunlight Counseling. Her interests include group, play, and art therapy at both the local and national level. Um, Dot uses her love of storytelling to integrate Islamic psychotherapy um, in her parent and youth development workshops. She served as the content editor for the first comprehensive Islamic health curriculum for adolescents and has also authored a number of discussion guides to help parents use movies as powerful education and mentorship tools. Dot has been a community organizer for more than 15 years. Her passion is working with parents, mentors, and schools to create safe, affirming spaces for youth to discover and establish their identity. She actively mentors Muslim youth and families through the Muslim American Society. So without further ado, do, um, please welcome our speaker, Sister Dot Hajjaj. Sister Dot, your mic's off. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa for the second time. Um, uh, welcome. Allahumma shrah li sadri wa yassir li amni wa hla luqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Uh, I hope, inshallah, that um, I can meet all of your expectations in terms of um, really working together to, to, to really work on this collective healing. And I'm honored to be in this space and presence of all you all, all of you as healers in this really difficult time that we're, uh, that we're in, um, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Can I share my screen right now, Wafa? Is that okay? Okay. I am going to share my screen. I'm just going to start off with a presentation and then we will go from there um actually let me get that from the very beginning all right let's try this again can you see my screen not yet it was showing a little bit ago okay let's try it again Okay, now it's showing. Yes? All right, perfect. Okay, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to have collective healing? 
um, and really, really taking on this idea of creating this healing circle for our constituents or our, you know, the members of our community with heart. Um, I want to talk a little bit about community healing. And, and, and when I talk about community healing, I want to talk a little bit about re -de deconstructing a lot of what we may see or what are the people that are coming to see us might um, experience, whether they're in their workforces or in their school environment or um, just generally speaking, um, what they're used to. And I'd like to kind of, for us to think of the power of community healing in our Muslim tradition and our Islamic tradition, um, there's, there's a quote where it says, community is a space where shared grief can heal. And this isn't something that's foreign to our, our tradition, our Islamic tradition. In the Prophet ﷺ talks about this idea that we are one ummah, one one entire group, one nation. And when one is suffering, you know, this, you know, we're all going to feel this fever. We're going to feel this aching in our body when when one part of the world or any Muslim in the world is is feeling this. And I I usually when I'm dealing with a group of you know people in a healing circle, I start with this particular idea of how important it is to heal as a group, to heal as a collective. Because oftentimes people will come into this space thinking, you know, I as a facilitator is the expert in the room and that I am somewhat going to fix them or to heal them. And I want them to understand that us by being together in one space and really feeling each other's emotions and connecting with one another, we are all healing one another. We are all sharing that space and understanding this idea that there doesn't have to be this hierarchy when it comes to healing. And this isn't something that's foreign to our traditions, whether it's indigenous traditions or the Islamic tradition, we know that um, when we are encouraged to pray, when we pray together, we pray together, we are rewarded a higher reward when we pray together. We talk about um, um, in Surah Al-Asr, in Surah the, uh, the Time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ He tells us to urge each other in goodness, to urge each other in perseverance. We don't live in silos. We cannot heal. We cannot really um, feel the feelings without being together as a group. And, and we know that one of the largest epidemics that the United, in the United States that people are dealing with is loneliness. A lot of, a lot of people feel they're very alone in their feelings. They're very alone in the way that they, they deal with the relationships and the people that they deal with in the world. And so we want to really hone in on this idea that this is not something that's foreign for us to be able to heal. And just being able to share that space is healing enough of itself. And, and I usually, when I'm starting off this and, and starting off this with a group of people, I remind them of a number of different stories of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and in our tradition as Muslims, where the Prophet Wasallam healed each the him and the companions and the people that were around them they were healing each other by sharing with each other their different emotions and the things that they went through in life so i'll give you a specific example when um the the daughter of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam one his her husband was taken as a ransom and she sent a necklace that belonged to her mother khadija radiyallahu anha as kind of as as a way to you know as a ransom for her husband to be released and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked at this necklace he he started to weep he started to cry because he remembered his late wife khadija and the companions that were around him they 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 felt the emotion with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they 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 shared with him that emotion and then he the prophet asked them is it okay if i could re if i if i release her husband because of the the strong emotion that he felt and the and the companions said of course and they felt the emotion at that time and there's so many different examples of that when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lost his his son Ibrahim, he wept, and and when you read the narration of the of the hadith of this of this story, um, what really struck me with this story is not necessarily that the prophet wept, but but that the companions around him asked him, 
Why are you weeping? What what's and 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 he described, you know, my heart is hurting. He he gave this description of how he was feeling, and it was natural and normal for people to to share those kind of emotions. Abu Bakr Siddiq, a great companion of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was very quick to be teary eyed. You know, anything would make him cry. And when you read these narrations of the companions around Abu Bakr Siddiq, they they asked him about his crying, not because they were telling him, you know, you need to move on or you need to stop crying, but because they wanted to feel the emotions and ask him and cry with him. And so this 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 concept of this idea that we bear witness is something that's very central to the idea of Islamic tradition. Even in, in the third surah, Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahid Allah annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikat wa ulul ilmi qa'iman bil qis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we bear witness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we bear witness that there is no God but He, but we wear witness for standing up for justice. So this, this verse in the Quran is this idea that when we see that justice is not being upheld, or we feel very frustrated with something, or we have some kind of grief, we together as a collective can sit and, you know, all of these, you know, fancy terms that people use in the mental health field of bearing witness. This was a word and a term that was used in the Quran many, many years ago. Shahid Allah, bearing witness for others. This is all part of a part and parcel of, of uh, our tradition. The Prophet Sallallahu there was one sitting where, um, you know, the companions approached the Prophet and said to him, you know, you're starting to look old. He had some extra white hairs in his hair. Um, and he was saying, you're starting to look old. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Shayyabatni hudu akhawatta. He, he started reading the Surah Hud and similar surahs. And because it talks so much about the Day of Judgment, it made his hair turn white because he was so stressed about it. And what I find beauty, what the beauty that I find in this story is the Prophet Sallallahu willingness to share how stressed he was to share why his his hair was was turning white and um i was remembering i don't know if any of you are following some of the journalists that are in, in palestine right now but there's this particular journalist visan and she had just recently shared a video of her hair turning white because she's so stressed and and it 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 hit a chord with so many people because she was being um, genuine and open about how she was feeling and what she was experiencing. And, and this is, this is the value of bearing witness with other people. And so I really, when, when starting a, a healing circle, it's really important to set the stage of this is normal in our tradition. This is natural in our tradition. This is something that helps us heal as a community. And it is extremely powerful. Um, and 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 I I open the floor for people in the in, you know in the group to share these ideas and maybe cultural practices that they do that are that considered community healing. So um, so things like rolling rolling grape leaves as a as a community, or um, maybe cutting uh, 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 a in our tradition we do cut, cut mulukhiya or a kind of dish that we eat, or or or. Um, breaking off pieces or sewing to threes, you know, we're doing like a lot of the needlework. So a lot of these things that are done in a community setting, or even sitting and drinking tea with your grandparents and the aunts and uncles in the room. We sometimes think that just having that space is something very normal, not, not to think about, but that particular space of being with, you know, intergenerational um, groups or really sharing those moments is is in and of itself um, extremely healing. And so I, I, I share that to have people kind of be at ease, that this isn't something where I'm going to sit here as the facilitator and be the expert and the doctor in the room to tell you how you're supposed to feel. I tell them, I'm learning from you. We're all learning from each other. And the energy itself, the space it, itself is is healing and for those of us that work in trauma work we understand that we understand that when we are in attunement with other people sometimes we don't have to say a word at all so so things like you know a lot of the somatic work that we do with you with 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 our clients sometimes you don't say anything but the fact that you are there in attunement and having that empathy for those that are around you is enough especially in a world where particularly with this topic 
oftentimes people are policed in how they should say things or how they should do things or how they should think or the emotions that they feel that they they're being too angry or too upset or too whatever it is um really setting the stage where we give the notion and the idea that it's safe here and it's healing is really really important important and i'm assuming that we're keeping questions and discussions towards the end is that right um with that Okay, so let's keep moving. Um, so when I when I go into a, uh, a a healing circle, I like to give the 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 people in the room um, something that they can perhaps maybe hold with their hands or feel because sometimes the emotions run really high, and it can feel um, very scary and very overwhelming when everyone's sharing these really strong emotions. So there's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that talks about, it talks particularly about anger, but I'm extending it to very, very strong emotions where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi gives us this hint and this, this, this clue it, it, to help us with these strong emotion is to cling to the ground. And we can't always cling to the ground, particularly when we're sitting in a group. So what I usually like to bring into a, a healing session is I bring things that are related to the ground. So things like pebbles and rocks or pieces of wood or frankincense. Um, I cut herbs from my garden and it really also helps if you can bring things that are indigenous to whatever the people in your group are dealing with. So um, I did a healing circle for Palestinians and I brought things like sage or maramiya. Um, I brought things like uh, za'atar. And these are all, you know, um, herbs that are native to the ground. Um, and so it people were really excited and really happy to just, I put a little basket at the very beginning. And I said, and I put the hadith, you know, up there on the screen. And I said to them, you know, I want you to be able to hold something while we're, you know, going through this healing process. And it helps them. It helps ground them. It gives them something to hold on to while we're going through that. So just a suggestion to give them um, th that feeling. And I think we understand this in our culture and our tradition. Again, there is something therapeutic and healing when we do things with our hands, right? And look at all of the indigenous cultures. They have the, the needlework. They have, you know, the, the cooking where you're going through each of the steps of harvesting and touching the food that we eat. This is very, very healing. And so to kind of bring that into the room helps the process as well. Um, I want to share with everyone, since this is a, a mostly Muslim group, this this um, this hadith of the Prophet wasallam that talks about how a believer is like a fresh tender plant, and I and I bring and I like to bring this up with even the the those in the room of a, of a healing circle because there's always going to be something that comes in our way right something difficult whether it's news or and and I'm talking about healing circle in general I know right now the the focus is on what's happening in Palestine but any type of healing circle we want people to be able to be like that tender plant where this wind that comes right it, we, we bend with the wind, but we, we just pull ourselves back up again, right? Um, instead of being someone, and this, and, and this is the analogy to calamities that hit us. And in this uh, living on this earth, we're always going to be hit with calamities. Um, and so versus the person who is like a pine tree and who's very rigid and doesn't move with the wind, right? And so then they break. Right. So to be able to give that understanding and that idea is um, it's not that we're never going to have the wind or the calamities that are going to hit us. But for us to be flexible enough to to um, to move with that wind as well. Mm. So I, I'd like for us I'm. Um, to create some kind of a framework of what are the three aspects of, um, you know, running an effective healing circle. Um, and Patty Dye wrote this excellent book called The Geography of Loss. And in that book, she identifies three aspects of navigating grief. It's particular to grief, but I'm extending it to this idea of any kind of very strong emotion that people want to be able to heal from. 
And, and she identifies three steps. And, and this is what I adhere to when I'm running a healing circle. Number one is to give people the opportunity to embrace what is really what it, and, and I'll delve into each of these uh, in a minute, but to really embrace what is, what that means is feel the feelings, walk into this new landscape that you have, right? Are you angry? Are you upset? Are you, are you sad? Are you whatever the emotions are? And then the next step of the healing circle is to honor what was. There is some gap that happened between this event or this, you know, this grief process, whatever triggered your strong emotion and how you were before or how things were before. Um, like, you know, I was reading on some of these posts that people are saying, they're like, I I can't even follow any of my old influencers anymore. I can't watch movies without thinking about, you know, what's happening in Palestine. I can't, you know, enjoy the same things that I enjoyed before. I feel like I'm a different person. So to be able to say, okay, this is what I was, or this is how my life was before. And what is it now to really notice the difference? And then the last thing is to love what will be really taking and funneling all of that energy that we have in the room and putting it in into something um, in the future. How are you going to take action? How are you going to deal with a lot of the things that you may be dealing with right now? So three simple steps, embrace what is, honor what was, and love what will be. So let's talk about what does it mean to embrace what is. When we say what embracing what is, you as a facilitator, you want to allow the opportunity for those in your um, uh, your group to to break open. And this is a term where we want people to to take down their guard right because for the longest time especially in the in 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 the western community oftentimes um people are um not giving themselves permission to feel all the feelings right we can't be too angry we can't be too sad we can't even be happy or proud because why why are you happy and proud about what's happening right we we oftentimes police our own feelings. You know, we we were not giving ourselves the chance to really feel all those feelings. So the first step of running a healing circle is to allow people to express those feelings, to really ask those open-ended questions of, so how are you feeling right now? And to really listen with compassion and pay attention to the nonverbal cues and to gently um, gently notice those cues and say them out loud. So sometimes people are so used to, um, I can't say anything. I can't say anything. I can't say anything. So, and especially since they're having all their like, um, grounding things, I'll notice in the room, for example, that they'll be like touching their herbs or, you know, their rocks or something. And I know there's something festering in there and I'll say something I'll say, um, you know, so um, I'm noticing that you're doing this, or, you know, I'm noticing that this is a, a, a very emotional time for you. And just kind of just really gently tapping in like that. And I'm sure a lot of you who are therapists know how this works. It kind of just opens up the door for them to, 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 to share with one another. Really like it, paying attention to the spaces in between. When I talk about the spaces in between, it's like when someone shares and you can notice someone else's like nodding or, um, you know, in agreement or starts to, 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 to tear up or, 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 you know, their leg starts moving really quickly. Um, I notice the connections and then I, and I, and then I talk about it. I say, well, it seems like you are connecting with this person's emotion. It seems like you are in agreement. And then those, you know, usually kind of opens, opens up. Um, this idea of bearing witness, the untold stories for many people who join healing circles, they have so many stories and secrets and things that they have been keeping inside of um, whether it's a grief circle or with this particular topic of, 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 of Philistine of like, I'm so angry at my coworkers, you know, or um, I don't want to learn anything from a white person again. People, people have been saying that to me in some of these healing circles and to be able to under to give them the space and the, and, and the place to say the things that they perhaps cannot say outside. 
it's really important to watch out for these three things because we're so trained. Um, you know, human beings are trained to give advice quickly or they can't really um, fathom to see this really strong emotion. If someone's angry or someone's crying, they want to either rescue them, right? They're not, everyone in the room is not a therapist. So they want to rescue them. So sometimes they'll jump in and say, well, maybe you can do this. Or you have people in the, in the room who will just jump into rationalization. So I, I did a high school group recently and we were talking about Palestine and some of the high schoolers uh, will, will start off saying in 1948, and I, and I said to them, guys, we're not doing history here. You, we, you know, you don't have to talk about history. We don't have to talk about what happened. Let's just talk about how you feel, what's going on, you know, what's, what are, what's festering inside of you and no, you know, I'm not, you know, placing judgment on them, but it's a matter of redirecting as a facilitator, you want to redirect the the, you know, the history giving the rationalizations of why they feel, well, I think I feel this way because X, Y, Z, or, you know, I think you should go and um, read more Quran, this, this spiritual bypassing, this idea that, you know, um, skip over all of the feelings, skip over all the emotions and go and pray and go and read Quran and be religious, right? The, all of these things, and you'll be fine right? We're, we're, a lot of us are trained that way. But in order for us to reach that point where we honor what was and we love what will become, right? What, what will be, um, we have to feel the feelings first. And so this is kind of another like um, kind of shift when we're dealing with a lot of the people that are in the room is whenever we see those, those three, you know, um, you know, whether it's rationalization or advice giving or any of those, we just redirect. For some communities and some circles, you may need to jumpstart the conversation because people may not be used to or comfortable talking about their emotions. So what I have done in the past is maybe I'll put a photo up like the one that I have right now on the um, screen that you know isn't gory or isn't too overwhelming, but something that elicits an emotion. Or maybe I'll put a quote like for some of my... Um, uh, teenagers that I worked with, I put like some outrageous quote that someone said in the news that, that was very popular and I'll, you know, pass it out or I'll put it up on the screen or, or whatever it is. And then that usually gets, gets, gets them moving, particularly for groups that may not be used to talking or, um, has a, ha, ha, have difficulty bringing that up. Um, so in, to recap, embracing what is, is, the allowing, the permission with compassion to have people share. And this is probably the bulk of the bulk of a healing circle. My guess, that's my guess from what I've done in the past is um, this usually takes the majority of the time because people really want to talk about how they feel. Um, I have a few examples here. Um, of what that looks like in the Quran, uh, you know, when we talk about the story of Yusuf, uh, Yusuf um, and his father Yaqub, you'll notice that um, he, the, the surahs, the, the ayahs in the Quran talk about the emotions and the feelings of, 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 of Yaqub, um, you know, this is when he knew that both Yusuf and his brother Binyamin had had lived and so had was the brothers were were took them and they didn't come back. Um and he says, I you know, Watawala and whom wakala ya asafa ala Yusuf wa biyadat aina whom in al husn bahua kalim. He's Allah SWT is describing the emotions that Yaqub, the father of Yusuf, has as he finds out that he doesn't have his sons. And he talks about, you know, he turns away, right? He's he's saying, I feel so this, you know, yeah, asafa ala Yusuf. He's feeling this, this really strong feeling of loss and because of the tears he he lost his 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 eyesight and then in another scene the 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 brothers and the people around Yusuf are lamenting him about they're saying are you just going to talk about Yusuf and your feelings over and over again you know when are you going to get over this right and and he responds with i only complain my anguish and sorrow to allah 
And I, I'm bringing this as a specific example because I think it is beautiful and noteworthy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about in this these verses the 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 the, um, the timeline of events that there will always be people that will try to rush others through their emotions. Like why are they're telling Yusuf's dad, why are you why are you not over this? You should be over this by now, right? Like, you, why are you still upset? This was so many years ago, right? Or it's been 75 years of occupation. When are you going to like, you should be, you shouldn't be as angry. It's, it's a done deal, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes the importance of feeling the feelings, right? And this idea of complaining or talking about those feelings so this i i bring this up because sometimes in many of our um cultural spaces it's taboo to show the feelings you have to be strong you can't do that or maybe it's not you know you're not being grateful to allah for not showing the feelings but this verse in the quran shows us that, that that's not what the that's not the case step number two or part number two uh to put in a to, to keep in mind as your framework when we're talking about um, community circle is to honor what was. What that means is to really pay attention to the difference, the gap, the chasm in whatever grief process that the people in your healing circle are going through. Um, what is the wisdom to ask for, to allow people after they fe they felt the feelings, we are human beings. I, I tell people this all the time. A cat, for those of you who have cats, if you throw a ball from the side of the room, the cat's eyes or vision will follow that ball, right? They'll just follow the ball. Human beings look to where the ball is coming from. They're always asking themselves, well, why? Why is this happening in Gaza, right? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to Muslims? What's hap you know, and and oftentimes when we get stuck in this why or how, we we have this downward spiral. So as as part of facilitating this group is we allow people to feel the feelings, but we also give them the chance to ask those questions, to ask the questions of how come, why is this happening, and to really infuse this important pillar of of iman of qada and qadar that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. There is a wisdom behind of all of this. And when you look at the people of Gaza, they are exemplary, you know, in, in terms of understanding this peace. They see the wisdom, even though the people, you know, it's such it's such it's heart-wrenching and it's difficult. They they have this sense or this mindset of focusing on the wisdom and acknowledging that wisdom. And we know that the hadith of the Prophet is wondrous that says wondrous is the fear of the believer. There is good for him in every matter. If you know if something bad happens to him, he's ha um he shows patience if something is good for him. He thanks Allah and he and they know he knows or she knows that there is good in everything that happens. In the Quran, it says sometimes you think something is good for you, but it's bad, and sometimes you think something is bad, but it's good, right? But for us to pay attention to those things, and if you notice in a lot of the the videos and commentary when, you know, right when this war started, you know, we know that the war is a lot older than October the 7th, but right now in this new resurgence of it, um, you'll notice this change in the talk when people are commentating, right? At the beginning, people are angry and they're upset and they're crying and people move in, in and out of the emotions of all the feelings. But then you have people posting things like, um, what does Allah want from us in this? How can we change? You know, what is the wisdom behind this? And the reason why as human beings we do that is because it gives us solace. It helps us cope, right? And so for you in this, in your healing circle, you want to be able to give them the chance to dabble in that a little bit to say okay well what do you think or what you know what do you think the wisdom might be what do you think this you know how have you changed as a person so a lot of people are like you know I used to be I used to waste so much time and now I'm so much more hyper focused on justice and helping other people or I can't believe I never really cared about the indigenous people in the United States and now I feel like I'm caring more about them and I'm more invested in them right so this this Paying attention to the change that's happening in you as a human being is really important. Or for us to say things like, 
I never really knew anything about Palestine. I just, you know, I kind of just heard the news or whatever. And But now I, I didn't realize how much I was misinformed. And now I'm reading more books about it, right? So for you to be able to honor your current self and the change that has happened is this second step of this framework. It's also important in this, in this stage to pay attention to the triggers. So in some of the healing circles that I've been running, um, individuals that have also gone through war. So I have some Yemenis in, in my community who are like, this is, this is bringing up all the things that have happened in, in the past. And I, and I thought that I healed from it, but I didn't. And now it's resurfacing again, or I've had women in my healing circles who are a part of the abusive, abusive relationships. And they'll say something like, Every time I read what Israel does to the Palestinians, I'm like thinking this is exactly my relationship that I that I'm in right now, right? So for a lot of people, um, the things that you talk about in this part of the framework oftentimes triggers things that might have been covered that were never really processed in the first place or minimally processed. So it 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 resurfaces, resurfaces. To, so to be able to allow for that space where people are like, well, why do I, why am I, why am I angry at this person or that person or this? And then to be able to tell them, yeah, this is normal. This happens. You'll have a resurfacing of a lot of triggering things. Um, I'm going to just run through that really quickly. It's really important when we talk about honoring what was is that we don't fall into this hole of self-blame. Because a lot of people, they'll be like, I can't believe how awful I was. I wasn't paying attention to Palestine. I wasn't being a good Muslim. You know, I, you know, I wasn't being cognizant and fair and just with the indigenous peoples that were here in the United States. I'm I'm such an awful person, right? But it's really important that we remind them of the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, that the Prophet teaches us that we don't, we're not. A, a community of if we're not the prophet teaches us that you don't say that if only i had done such and such if i only i had done such and such no we recognize and honor what we were and who we were and then we say okay what can i do next um which um there's a really great book out there if you haven't already read it it's called your lord hasn't forsaken you i have it right here it's by uh, Najwa Awad and Sara Sultan and they do a really excellent job of um, it's called Your Lord Has It Forsaken You. Um, they do a really excellent job of differentiating between the uh, differentiating between self-blame and accountability. And having that understanding will help you uh, kind of manage the conversations because you'll have a lot of people that will fall in this self-blame, like, oh, I'm such a bad person. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm not, you know, especially with what's going on, they feel really bad about, you know, I'm watching all of these social media accounts and I'm not able to cook a meal for my family, or I'm not able to function properly at work or all of the, you know, normal things I'm in a brain fog. Right. And, and they feel really awful about it. And instead of really kind of shifting them to this idea is it's normal, it's natural. Okay. We, we can, we can kind of sit with those feelings, but then what do you want to do next? Which leads me to this last part. Um, oh, usually what I do before I kind of move on to the last section, which is love what will be, what will be, um, I try to do some kind of a visualization exercise um, because a lot, so far they've probably been sharing together as a group. And sometimes, particularly the introverts in the room, um, want to be a little introspective. So I give them a chance to do that. So I'm like, okay, I want you to visualize if we're talking about Palestine as an example, I want you to visualize maybe a child or an image or something that you saw that, you know, really spoke to you and just close your eyes and think about it and process it. What does it say to you? What, how are you feeling about this? You know, or I have them visualize their strong emotion, put a color to it, put a feeling to it, and maybe like put it in a book or an album. And I kind of have them go through that particular visualization process where they're either, you know, looking, I'll have them pretend or visualize looking through a photo album. And it could be a photo album of the images that they're going through, whether it's grief of an individual or a person that really means something to them or of the current events and to really hone in on one 
and have a conversation with the emotion or the person or that first particular incident. And then I just kind of bring them back together again, just to give everybody a different way of processing, not just the collect the, the collective, but also some introspection. So the last, and I'm probably running out of time. Um, the last part is love what will be. This is the part where we share with our um our, our the members of the healing circle, um, okay, what next? Um and and I like to share, you know, um trees in nature play a very central role in the way that I do therapy. So if you notice a lot of the hadith and the and the verses are have to do with trees. So in this particular one, the Prophet ﷺ says, if the final hour comes while you have a shoot of a plant, so basically a sapling. It, and it is possible to plant it before the hour comes, you should plant it. I really love this hadith of the prophet because it tells us that even if you feel despair, even if it's at the very end, even if it's a very difficult time, you still do good. You still strive to do good. You still strive to do better, right? And, um, and, and sometimes that means that we have to only invite those that help us get better or be better, right? It, it allows for that filtration process. This is where people are like, well, you know, maybe so-and-so isn't very supportive in the way that I feel, or maybe my work environment isn't the best, or maybe, you know, I've been looking up to all of these professors and teachers that I thought, or, you know, or friends that I thought were on my side, and maybe they're just not, right? And so really answering the question of who will you invite in to your new story? Who will be a part of your new story? And how can you funnel all of those really strong emotions into positive action? And, and for different people, it's different things. So for some people, they're going to pro protest. For some people, they're posting, you know, things on online or on social media. For others, they're writing poetry. You know, for, for, for people like us, we're running healing circles, right? So it's, it's, it it allows us to funnel that or or our job as facilitators is to um is to give people the chance to funnel that energy um into into uh, all of that um into something of positive it also gives people the chance to understand that you can allow for others to feel the feelings that you have so just like we don't want other people to police our emotions we should also allow for the anger we should allow for the sad the deep sadness we should allow for the happiness and the pride for so many people when they saw like examples from from Gaza of people being so resilient in their faith it's okay to be happy and proud that these people are going to end up in Jannah or you know that they have that strong resilience it's okay to be happy that people are reading more about the Quran or more about Islam those are some really positive things to have as well um this idea, we want people to understand that healing, you don't need an expert to heal others. You have the power to heal others by being a positive force and a, an active listener and for holding space with other people. And this idea that I trust in Allah's plan, that things will be good, just like we talked about in this last part of the framework. I want to end with this um in, the, in this part of the framework, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us the story of Mary, Maryam alayhi salam, right? He very much personalizes her story. He doesn't just give us a, a list of facts of what happened. No, he tells us how she felt in that moment when, when she knew that she was, was she was pregnant. She says, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasya man sayya. I wish I was dead before this day, right? And Allah in the Quran doesn't reprimand her for having those emotions and feelings. She felt like dying out of this extreme, you know, worry that what would people say, right? But the key of this verse, Allah says to her then, He says to her then, shake the, 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 the trunk of the palm tree. And for those of you who know a palm tree, a palm tree is not shakable. It's very difficult. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling her to shake the palm tree so that dates can come down. 
not because she's physically strong enough to do that, but he's giving her the message that you have to do something. Take that energy, take that emotion that you have and do something with it. Whatever that thing is, even if it's really tiny and small and it might not be, you know, um, something that's huge. Um, there's a concept called grief groceries. I don't know if for the therapists that are out here in the, in the group, um, this idea is don't wait for someone to tell you what they need when we heal others. Um, when people are going through grief, particularly loss, um, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful gesture to just go buy them groceries and leave it at their doorstep. Right. And this is also in our tradition. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said when the death of Jafar ibn Abi Talib came, he told the companions prepare food for the family of Jafar for there has come to them what has preoccupied them. This is, this is a natural thing. It doesn't mean you have to sit and talk. Sometimes people don't want to talk, but to be creative in how we, I'm, I'm calling it gentle activism, to be creative in how we are active. Um, and it comes in so many different forms. If it's cooking a meal for so-and-so, then be it. If it's, you know, calling someone on the phone and, 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 and really, you know, lending an ear, then that's fine. It's really important that you also, you are also monitor the room where people are not shaming others for different kinds of activism because people will do that. Well, I can't believe you didn't go to a protest or I can't believe, you know, you didn't post one thing on social media, right? Um, let people be active in the way that they know how in the way that they feel comfortable. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he talks about change, he says, if you see something that needs change, the first step is to change it with your hand. And if you can't change it with your hand, then change it with your tongue. And if you can't change it with your tongue, then hate it in your heart. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ told us these various stages of change means there's options. Of course, there's one that's a lot more stronger. However, not everybody is at the same level in terms of, of their activism. So to be able to kind of help people understand that based on their personalities, based on where they are in life, based on whatever it is that they're going through, they're going to have different kinds of activism. And to be gentle in the approach of movie, of, of practicing this third framework of creating a new story and, and, and becoming active. And last, to be able to, um, for those that uh, uh, appreciate that, uh, to be give, to give them this idea of some sense of a spiritual healing. Um, uh, this, this verse in the Quran has a saying that a lot of the people in Gaza themselves have been saying, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And there it is again, nature, I'm telling you guys, nature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when we are we are in some kind of a difficulty or, or calamity. The words that we should utter and what we should remind ourselves is we're all returning to dust. We're all going back to the soil. We're all returning back to Allah. It humbles us, right? It, 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 it really brings us to this idea that we are connected to the earth. And when we say it, when we utter it, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, our bodies were never ours to begin with. We're just using our bodies for rent. We're all going to go back to the earth. And there's a sense of solace and calm that comes to, to, with this with this concept that we're going, we're, we're just soil and we're going back to that. And alhamdulillah for Islam, um, it's, it's such a blessing to be able to understand that concept and that connection because I couldn't imagine how people who go through any type of difficulty would go through it without this idea that there is wisdom in this and that we're going, we are a part of this earth, or this earthly plan. The Quran talks about this kind of resilience, you know, when there is difficulty, um, those who are resilient say the word and I'm sure with the images coming out of Gaza we see this all the time they say God is sufficient for us and he is the best uh, protector and then if, if, it, if it feels right for you it, it depends on the different groups that I've been with if it feels right for you in terms of your group it might be a nice idea to have people have some kind of a collective prayer. And again, it doesn't have to look a certain way. It doesn't have to be in a certain language. Allow people, I, I did a collective prayer with a group of fourth and fifth graders. And it was so beautiful. They all had really just 
wonderful, innocent things to say. They all kind of went in a circle and they, you know, they, they kind of each said their own thing. And we, you know, and, and we said, let's lift it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's lift it up to Allah and he will answer the prayer eventually. So to be able to give them that chance for that collective dua. And if you feel like that's difficult for people, then to ask people to kind of internalize whatever, whatever prayer, um, whatever prayer they, dua is just another word for prayer. My name means prayer. Um, to internalize whatever prayer or whatever feeling or or mention that they want um, in, to to kind of kind of what do you say package uh, everything that they've learned or they've healed in that process. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I probably went overboard um, on the timing. Let's see. I'll stop it right now. And I I I've read some of the some of the um the 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 comments um. But I guess I'm I'm open for questions right now. Jazakumullah khair. Um, so I'm thinking we can open it up if anyone wants to ask a question via mic. And then there were a few people who sent me questions via chat that I can read aloud. Um, but I think we can open it up and then I'll get to the ones in the chat, inshallah. I, I had a question. Oh. Um, Assalamu alaikum. I, first of all, I love your references to nature and plants because um, I feel like there's such a, a, a healing resource for a lot of people. Um, I wanted to ask you when you have, uh, you mentioned having introverts in the healing circle. And so what, you know, as a facilitator, how do you think we should respond to that? Um, do we try to reel them in and encourage them to say something um, or let them be as it is? Um, so sometimes I kind of test the waters a little bit um, because I'm not sure 100 percent if someone is um, just truly doesn't want to share or um, they have something that they want to say, but they've just kind of been um, trained that it's you can't share, right? So sometimes what I'll do is I'll notice like a specific uh, cue or something that's, you know, in their, you know, um, verbal, you know, their nonverbal cues, I'll notice it and I'll say something like, I'll say, you know, um, I noticed you teared up a little bit when so-and-so said this thing. And sometimes if they want to share, they'll say something like, yes, and then they'll They'll kind of continue the conversation. Um, and other times if I miss the mark and I'll say something like that and they don't want to share, they'll tears sometimes will just kind of roll down their face and they'll just nod. And I, and I just, I let it go with that because them just being there is healing enough of itself. It doesn't necessarily mean I have to have them speak. People break open in different ways. Um, so, um, I I had one uh I had one woman where um she had like her rosemary and she literally like took off every like leaf right and I felt that was that was her that was her way of breaking open and so there's different ways so I you know sometimes it's 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 nice to kind of check in but if people still are like not ready to share I don't I don't push them if I, I can suggest something, um, it, you can also ask introverts if, you know, if they know that they are not going to participate, just have a paper and pen with them and then they can express themselves in writing. And Absolutely. either way, they've actually let that feeling out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, the rosemary person. <laughs> I do have several questions that came in via the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so one person's asking, what grounded practices or materials can we help attendees rely on in virtual healing spaces where we can't physically provide them those things? Oh, sorry, with that, could you repeat that last part again? Because it... Yes, um, what, uh, what grounding practices or materials can we help attendees rely on in virtual healing spaces where we can't physically provide them those things? 
So I would ask them to go and find something that they feel like comforted by. Like, is it a blanket? Is it, I don't know, a squishy toy? Is it soup? Is it tea? Um, and I give them a few minutes to do that. I'm like, I want you to find, they're like, well, I don't really have anything. I was like, anything, what makes you feel good? Like what's what, you know, even if it's something so small, you're doesn't matter, but that I would have them go and give them a few minutes to go and find something that will help them, will help ground them. And I could, maybe what would help is sometimes people have a hard time brainstorming. Maybe you could put a few suggestions in the chat box if it's a virtual space of things that might work. There was a few questions asking if you could um, share the title of the book again. I think it was the book that you referenced, the um, last book you referenced, and then the first one. Okay. The first one is called The Geography of Loss. It's by Patty Dye, D-I-G-H. And the second book is called Your Lord Has Not Forsaken You. And that's by Najwa Awad and Sara Sultan. It's a Yaqeen book. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, someone asked, um, how can we respond to people who say we should be strong and make us feel guilty about feeling the way that we do, given that the people of Gaza are the ones experiencing the direct pain? Um, sorry, I was reading. I'm, so, I'm sorry. With, I was reading another question at the same time. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. Um, someone said, how can we respond to people who say we should be strong and make us feel guilty about feeling the way that we do, given that the people of Gaza are the ones experiencing the direct pain? So is this per a person a facilitator or is this just a person like, uh, are we talking about facilitating if someone says that to a facilitator or what? I think more general, like if someone says that to someone in a group. Yeah, I would just I would just say exactly what we just shared before. Like people people process, people go through emotions in different ways, right? It's there's um so Omar ibn Khattab is not like Abu Bakr Siddiq. And they were both amazing companions, right? Omar ibn Khattab, he was all about justice. He was very like you know, firm in the way that he dealt with things, right? But Abu Bakr Siddiq was more soft-spoken. He was more, you know, he cried at things, right? So I think it's important for us to be able to give grace, I guess if that's the best word, to 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 how people process their emotions. And, and remember, you know, sometimes people freeze. <laughs> sometimes people freeze when it's something that's so difficult like that. Sometimes they just they don't know how to respond, right? They don't know how to respond in 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 terms. As long as it's um, um, something that they're that they're gradually thinking about and 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 processing, that's what's the most important thing. Um, someone asked, "How can we tune into attendees' reactions, response, and responses virtually? We see bodily reactions, responses, emotions in person, but what about in virtual spaces? Can we encourage people to turn their cameras on? And yet, when there's many people tuning online, how can we adequately pay attention to all of this? For example, an organization reached out for a 30-minute presentation followed by an hour open floor healing session with 100 to 150 attendees." attendees they won't they won't let it they won't want breakout rooms they won't want to cap on their attendees and i'm wondering how to navigate this as a clinician having done healing circles with capped attendees before i i would not call it a healing circle then <laughs> um 150 people where you can't really see their like their faces and you can't really feel their energy i'm a little biased because i I don't really like virtual settings, but, but, um, but, uh, it could be an informational session on best practices of healing, like what we're doing right now, right? Like this isn't a healing circle. What we're doing right now is not necessarily a healing circle, but there is some sense of healing when we feel like, oh, that's what I was feeling. Or, you know, you know, like to be able to talk about emotions or whatever, or like how to like process it from an Islamic perspective. There is some sense of healing, but the real deep work that we were talking about where we're having people break open and and um, I don't know if it would work when you can't see people's uh, 
faces and and especially if there's 150 people in the room if there were small breakout rooms yes so i would just tweak it or or tell your organizer that okay this is something different this isn't really a healing circle this is more like an informational session on healing or something i don't know what you want to call it um someone asked and they're not sure if this is related to today's topic but they did want to ask it they said sister Da'at spoke about loneliness at the beginning of her presentation um mm-hmm. could Da'at talk about the mental health risks associated with being lonely is there a relationship between loneliness and psychiatric disorders loneliness often interacts with other risk factors such as mental illness in what ways does mental illness increase a person's risk of suicide how do we know if a teen is just severely depressed or at risk of committing suicide whoa that's a lot um i think we should have another session on loneliness because i, I do a whole thing on loneliness because um the u.s general surgeon came out this summer with this um long report on this epidemic that we have as human beings in the United States where we are really, that's the number one thing that we're suffering from right now. Um, and I don't know if I can really address all of those questions because it's a lot, but, but let's, let's, let me summarize really quickly. Um, there is such a wealth of information and richness in our tradition and history in dealing with this topic of loneliness. Like we are such a collective community. Like I'll give you guys an example. The Prophet says there's etiquette in terms of when you enter a room, who should greet who. The Prophet talks about when one of the one of the uh, rights of a Muslim to a Muslim is if someone is sick, you visit them. When there is a funeral, you go to the funeral, right? When, when there's a wedding, if someone invites you for an invitation, you shouldn't reject the invitation, right? The, we, 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 we kind of know these things in our tradition, but we haven't really thought about how that addresses this idea of creating a community that isn't so lonely. We've gotten so used to this very individual approach to living, especially after COVID, um, this individual approach to living that we've forgotten how it supposed to be when we're when we're um as a community and i'll give you one last example in our islamic tradition when someone sneezes what do what do we do right what is the tradition the tradition is we say alhamdulillah or you know we praise we praise the lord but then someone else just has to say yarhamukumullah right may allah may god have mercy on you and then in the tradition we respond we say, يَهْدِيكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيُصْلَحْ بَالَكُمْ There's a, we, we, we ask for Allah to, to guide that person, right? That, that's a back and forth. That's, that means like, that, it's not like we're sneezing and it's done. No, like even to the level of a sneeze, like I, it's so fascinating. Even to the level of a sneeze, there's this idea of we're, we're relying on each other. We're, there's this back and forth. And examples after examples, I could go on and on for an entire hour about how our tradition really, really like addresses this idea of loneliness. I, I, I could go on, but I don't think we have time today. <laughs> well, are you still here? I don't see your. I'm, I'm right here. Oh. Um, oh. We have several more questions, but I do see a hand up. Um, Amelia, did you have a question? Okay. Sorry, so, I'm, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> I'm like struggling with Zoom today. Um, I was just gonna say that whenever I feel lonely, I put on suits of baraka and uh, bakara, and mm-hmm. I will. <laughs> the baraka is coming from all the angels that are invited into your house. So when you feel lonely, you have to remember you're also existing in a metaphysical realm. You're not just in this material world, you know, in the flesh and bone. You have to remember your spirit is also alive. And when your spirit feels alone, you call the angels to be with you. And every time you enter the house, you say, assalamu alaikum, and the angels are there to respond back to you. So you're never alone. And Allah is as close to you as your jugular nerve. That's so beautiful, Amelia. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. You know, at the end of our salah, right? What do we say? Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. We say salam. 
to ourselves, but we also say salam to all the ibad salihin, all the good, the believers, all the people, even those who are there and those who are not there. Right? When we talk about um, uh, circles of knowledge, the Prophet sallam, teaches us there are stacks of angels. To what you were sharing, Amelia, which was so beautiful, there are stacks of angels that are with us in the room uh, in circles of knowledge. Hopefully, there are angels here amongst us because we're learning new things. So. The, this metaphysical realm that you're talking about is is extremely powerful when it comes to things like 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 loneliness and it is absolutely fascinating when you read the study we have this depth of knowledge and rich tradition when you read the study that the US general put out with this idea of loneliness and he talks about um people who are lonely it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day that's how it lowers your your um your life expectancy and the prophet sallallahu talked about this all the time he says silat rahim one of the ways that our lives are extended or our um our our ages are extended is when we uh, uh rahim is when we connect the family members when we connect with other family members and it's like the Prophet ﷺ said that, that a long time ago. It's in our tradition. And now this, this report is coming out that's saying, hey, you need to spend time with people and that's going to increase your life expectancy. Um, I had, there's about four or five more questions. I, I am mindful of time. Um, so inshallah, we'll try to get through these as quick as possible. Someone asked, are there recommendations for facilitators to help ensure slash promote emotional safety within groups? Resources, emotional safety within groups. Um, I can't think of resources off of the top of my head. Yalom is my one of my favorite people when we talk about groups. Uh, but uh, I, I'm... I also do, so for those of you who are familiar with somatic um, somatic therapies, uh, I do brain, um, brain spotting and brain spotting is a really great way. Group brain spotting is a really great way to, um, uh, to facilitate that. But I'll have to think about that one. Maybe I'll share it with you later, Wafa, in terms of resources. Perfect. Sounds good, inshallah. And whenever we send out the um, the recording to you all, inshallah, we can send out the book titles and any other resources um, that Sister Dot recommends. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, how can we manage if the emotions are too intense without policing emotions? Yeah. Well, I, I guess my follow-up question to that is, what do you mean by manage? <laughs> Um, because we also have to be very careful about our own transference and our own fears when we see emotion. Like sometimes, um, you know, for those who are therapists, we have to be okay with silence. We also have to be okay with the strong emotions. So someone crying, um, sobbing, um, seething anger, those are okay. Uh, so I... I guess the only time that I would quote unquote manage an emotion is if someone's emotion is um, perhaps maybe overtaking or um, um, overburdening someone else. So I'll give you an example. Um, someone in one of my groups was sharing um, how they as a, a physician or a nurse, she was in the medical field, was feeling very upset and very unsafe because the doctors that were around her were very nonchalant and indifferent to what was happening in some of the hospitals of Palestine. Um, and then there was someone else in the group that got very angry with her for saying that about other doctors and redire redirected her anger for whatever reason that she was feeling towards her individually. So that's where I kind of had to jump in and not allow for that to happen because it was um, it was between two people and not allowing them to feel the, the, the feelings that they needed to have. Um, but in terms of, so I guess the, to, to answer that question in terms of policing is I think you need to, we need to as facilitators to be introspective ourselves 
about how we feel about specific emotions. And if any of those emotions are uncomfortable with us and to process that on our own outside of the healing circle or before the healing circle. And if you feel like something is completely taking over it, like let's say someone starts like throwing things and wailing, you know, I'm just, I'm just, that's never happened to me before, but let's say that happens. That's why we start with a grounding experience. That's why we start with making sure everybody has a rock or a piece of wood or a, like a plant or a blanket. It doesn't matter. So that if they feel like it's so overwhelming and completely taking over the whole scene that we remind them, okay, I think now is a really great time for us to ground. You know, maybe you could bring everybody together, do some breathing exercises, some muscle relaxation, just to kind of just, you know, um, if if it's it's completely outrageous that but the threshold is different for different people. I think someone had their hand up while I was saying something. So maybe something, it was. So maybe it was. Sister Saima, do you have a question? Yeah, I think I um, asked in the chat message um, when uh, Sister uh, Doa was um, mentioning about the spiritual uh, bypassing. So I wasn't clear. Are we trying to say that should we do the bypassing by just asking them, okay, if you're distressed or it's bothering you, just go ahead and read the Quran. So is that what we're favoring? But isn't it that we would be having uh, rather that deal or to acknowledge it? Are we acknowledging it or are we telling them that you know what yes go ahead and just read the Quran you'll feel better I wasn't clear what the message is uh, Sister Dua. so when I said watch for spiritual bypassing means um, beware of it meaning um, pay attention to the people that don't give people the space or the permission to feel the feelings and jump really quickly to the spiritual part. That's what I meant by spiritual by bypassing. So okay. it's like, don't be angry. Don't cry. Like when people say, don't cry, go pray. Or, yeah. or, or, or don't be angry. You know, you have to go and uh, read the Quran, right? Like you, and, and I've had to talk about those things with, especially my teenagers, because they, they would say something like, well, aren't we supposed to like control our anger in Islam? Like, aren't we supposed to like make wudu? And, and I said, yes, absolutely. Yes. That is a really important thing to do, but it doesn't mean that you don't feel it first. You have to feel it first. Yeah. And then, which is the, the second part of the framework is honor that, you know, like, okay, then what do I need to do now? Okay, I need to make wudu, or I need to go pray, or I need to go read Quran, or I need to go run, or whatever, whatever it is that you do to cope with those emotions, you go do it, but you have to feel it first. And that's why I brought the verses from the Quran, because mm -hmm. in the Quran, Allah doesn't reprimand Yaqub or Maryam or any of these, you know, important figures in our tradition uh, it doesn't reprimand them on their emotions. He actually, Allah actually describes their emotions to us. Like imagine if someone, Maryam said, I wish I was dead before this moment, right? If someone came up in a typical, in our typical communities, right? Someone mm -hmm. came up and said that, oh, no, 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 right? Our response would be, oh, no, 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 no. Don't say that or don't do that mm -hmm. because that's not, Right. You have to go. And, you know, that's what I meant by spiritual bypassing. Okay. So I, when if you notice that in your group, in your healing circle, will someone in the group will be like, oh, no, don't go, go pray, go. You know, that's what I'm saying is the the first step of embracing what is needs to happen first. Let people feel the feelings. And then when we talk about honoring, then people can talk about, you know, you know, we ask the question of what has helped you cope? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, so what has helped you cope? Then people say, oh, you know, I, I like to cook or I like to do art or I like to, you know, read Quran or I like to, you know, all of those things. I hope that okay. answered your question. Yes. No, it's, it's much clearer now because usually that's what like, you know, we as Muslim community, like, you know, um, we just tend to, okay, you know, just um, not acknowledge the feeling and just, okay, at the minute you open the Quran or if you just do the Salah, you're going to start feeling better. No, that's not how it's going to translate yeah. okay okay yeah. much clearer jazakallah thank you jazakallah khair. amelia we will get to your question in one moment i just want to ask one um because the person said they do need to go um but if you know you've been um someone's been asked that do we have an islamic duty to call people out who are behaving um 
on social media as if nothing is happening in Palestine or not saying anything when they have a reach or a platform. Yeah. You know, I've been struggling with this one a little bit. Um, because from an Islamic perspective, like we talked about at the very end, um, from an Islamic perspective, it is our obligation and it is our responsibility to stand for justice, right? That's the first verse that I was sharing before, Shahidullah and no to stand for justice. Um and I think what I've come to the conclusion is, and I'm not an Islamic scholar, so I can't say 100%, but what I've come to the conclusion with is if I have a relationship with someone, like I can speak to them, I can talk to them about the importance of standing up for justice in whatever they feel is matches their personality and where they are in life then I will probably mention it to them. I will probably, you know, because in the, the Quran tells us, urge people to, to for the truth and urge people to be persevere, to have perseverance and to do the right thing. It is a, a part of our responsibility to urge people to do right things. So I feel like if I had a relationship with someone, I would probably, I don't know if I would necessarily call them out, but I would have a conversation with them and I would say, hey, you know, this. I think this is something that you... Um, it would be important for you to do. Um, but I don't know if I would personally um, just call out people here and there <laughs> um, if I don't know them or I don't have a relationship with them. Um, that's that's kind of where I stand because I don't know, because I don't know this person. I don't know the circumstances that they're in. I don't know what they might be going through. So I don't know What's the reasoning or the positioning of that? And I'll give you a specific example. Um, there are so many people that come from mixed families. Perhaps they are, you know, converts or, you know, not everybody in their family is going to be 100% on Palestine, right? Um, and when we talk about the, the fiqh of priorities or fiqh al-awliyat, right, we talk about Sometimes for them to keep the peace with their family members, they can't really speak so much about Palestine, like how everybody else does, right? And so I, I understand their perspective and I give them grace is their heart because the Prophet ﷺ gave us many different ways to call out, right? Their heart might be with the Palestinian people. Their heart might be, you know, I am standing up for Palestine. Some people are able to speak out, and that could include social media, and some people are able to change things with their hands. But a, a, the least of iman, the least of faith, is to really not like it in your heart and not able to do those first other stages. So I, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, and we have this idea, this concept in Islam of husn al dhan um, and so this idea of giving people the benefit of the doubt in those circumstances, because everybody comes from a different perspective. Um, so I wouldn't really call out people that I don't know, people that are close to me, I'll have a conversation with them and I'll understand that whether or not their circumstances allows for that. So. Um, Amelia, do you have a question before I get to the other one? Yeah, I just had a little bit of a um share mm -hmm. because I think you all mentioned the uh, emotional safety in a group. I wouldn't know, but um, there is this book that I really like and I'm currently in the process of reading it so I can defend soon, inshallah. And it's called Research is Ceremony. Research is Ceremony, three words. And then it says Indigenous Research Methods. And the whole point of this uh, book is to talk about how the process of research should be something that is healing and something that should be ceremonious. And so the we can ask those questions of like for the Muslim community, what it constitutes an emotional safe space for everybody. I think it changes depending on, like you said, Sister Dua, that you know you were saying like high school students versus adults versus elementary like the type of communication is different everything's different but I really like the section on relationality that part might be some good uh resource for ideas inshallah that sounds wonderful it sounds wonderful I think um in in, in general 
especially for those of us who have learned therapy in very um, Western neurocentric white spaces, all of us as therapists and facilitators have to decolonize, unfortunately, decolonize and deconstruct a lot of the ideas that we thought are supposed to be healing. And so I really like what you said, Amelia, about asking the questions, because sometimes we ourselves forget, forget what is important to these different healing communities. And we have to ask those important questions and I'll give people the permission, give people the permission and the uh, to to heal in the way that their ancestors have done forever and what their hearts tell them works like something like even in grad school like there's some things that they tell you that are healing and you're like this isn't this is this doesn't feel right for me right this doesn't feel right and there are things I, like um my my family my original family is from Egypt um and my my dad is from a village in Egypt and I didn't realize how therapeutic it is for women to sit in a circle and roll things like grape leaves to cut up to cut up leaves from the garden right or from the from the from a harvest you 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 don't you don't realize it you don't realize it until you're far away from it and you try these other white eurocentric ways and then you're like this is this is a bunch of baloney compared to all of this other stuff right and so i know i'm using old terminology but that's but really that's what it is that's actually what it is. It feels it feels right. And you walk out of those spaces feeling healed. And I think we've forgotten. We've forgotten. Our bodies haven't forgotten. Our DNA and our ancestors have not forgotten. So we need to be able to, and, and if anything that has come out of this Palestinian conflict, to be honest, is this unveiling of, dude, I thought all these people were helping me, helping me help others. And it's like, now it's like, no, I don't want any of this anymore. I want our stuff. Our, and, our, and we have so much to offer to the world. We really do. Sister Duat, sorry, did you see the video of Mortaz and the Makluba? Yes, I did. It made me so happy. I did. I did. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. It's, it's, it's so fascinating when you see these like you, you you don't think of cooking a meal together it that that's healing but it is you know I, I the other day I was telling people I was like we need to change how we heal like because of what we've been taught in grad school is just so off so like we need rooms where we cook together we need rooms where we sew together we need rooms where we harvest the ground together. Like, like it's, I'm a very avid gardener, by the way. And I can't tell you how much it, it's, how spiritually healing it is to be connected to the earth. And Islam says that all, all across the board, it says that. I do have two more questions. Um, someone asked, should we ever give emotional prompts in healing circles? Example, giving language to experiences people may not know how best to describe, like the word God. Yes. So like I mentioned before, on one of my slides, I wrote, it's okay to jumpstart. That's what I mean by it's okay to jumpstart. So um, I walked into a high school uh, healing you know, place um, uh, and... Um, I was worried that the teenagers would be like, oh my God, this is so stupid, you know? Um, so what I did was I printed out a whole bunch of like quotes from, from journalists like Moatez or Bisan or like, you know, or even things that people were on the, you know, Zionist side were saying, um, like, you know, people were saying, you know, go get them or flatten them or, you know, all these like really like, just awful things that people were saying and thing and really amazing things that people were saying. And I printed them out on strips of paper and I put them out on a, like a table. And I was like, I was like, pick one that resonates with you or you have something to say about, you know? And so they all picked up their little pieces of paper and they were, you know, they were really excited about it. And then I told them, I said, 
find someone else that, and, and, and they weren't repeated. The prompts weren't repeated. I said, find someone else that has a similar emotion based on your strip, your strip of papers. And it, that got them talking because then they were like, yes, I can't believe I'm so angry. Why would somebody say something like that? Or like, you know, Mortez is my hero. You know, like people, people were just like, and so everybody was, it got the conversation going. So, and, and there's different ways of doing that. So I, with the high schoolers, I did like little prompts, uh, but you could maybe put some pictures. Like I put one, uh, one, um, I was doing like a mom healing circle and I put a photo of, you know, how they were writing names on people's arms and I put it up there and, you know, just different images. And I was like, okay, which of the images do you resonate with? Right. And so sometimes people need a little bit of a nudge and that's okay. Um, and if you're not sure you can test the waters, right. It's all a matter of trial and error. So you can go in and you can be like, okay, so how do you all feel? And it's like pin drop. So I always have a plan B. When you walk into, when you walk into a healing circle, always have a plan B and a plan C. So you, so, so you, you, you test the waters. If everybody's chatty and everybody's okay, then you don't really need the jump starts. But if you feel like, okay, this is going to be hard, then you pull up your, pull up your pictures, pull up your strips of paper or whatever it is. And, and I'm sure all of you are very creative to think of different ways to do that. Jazakumallah, Fed. I'm going to leave. It was so wonderful. And I, inshallah, hope to meet you all in person. Inshallah. So our last question is, uh, the person said, I had a question regarding helping those who have relatives in Palestine. What are some specific pointers to say slash help those who have relatives dying from a therapist lens? Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's grief, just like all of these other, um, uh, griefs. And I, I, depending on where they are spiritually or religiously, I know that if, um, if spirituality is something that gives them solace, I know that that has helped people in the past that have been in my groups that have people in Gaza or people in war torn um, parts of the world. Um, and, we use the example of the people of Gaza, right? Like we talk about the people who are gone or the people who are difficulty are really in a better place, right? They're in Jannah, they're, you know, and I like to use the visualization piece for this particular um, issue because it's such a difficult, um, this idea of qahr, right? It's such a difficult emotion to kind of grapple with that sometimes we have to, um, separate ourselves to this other realm where they can imagine what could be or what is happening. So sometimes what I will do is I'll say something like, can you close your eyes for a second and think or visualize this person that you lost or this person who's, you know, in this, in this situation, that's very difficult. And that usually like elicits a lot of breaking open, which is good. Um, but then I have them imagine what it would be like to have a conversation with them or what is something that they would like to say or what is something that that person would like to say to them, right? Um, and then so I give them a space or a realm where they can be with those people that they that they were hoping to be with or share that space with. And then after doing that, I hopefully have them shift their conversation to, instead of that person, shift that conversation to Allah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-baqi, right? He is the one who is with us at all times and is here at all times. So I want to give them something that they can go home with, that they can go back with, that they can, a, 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 the creator that they can have a conversation with, because I'm not going to be there for them. I'm not going to necessarily help them visualize through all of that, you know, and that person that they lost is not going to be there for them. But what is there or what it continues to be there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to give them this idea that Allah is there, you the you can talk to him in your sujood, you can talk to him in your prayer and your dua. You don't even have to do it through ritual prayer. You can go on a hike and go look at the sunset and go look at the moon and really feel 
the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his presence through his creations, right? Feed the birds. You know, Allah, there, by the way, just like there are so many ahadith with trees, there's a lot of them with birds too. So um, when so to create some kind of a, a ritual where they are connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have those conversations, not necessarily verbal conversations, but heart conversations. So um, there's a hadith that the birds, they they rely on, be, the Prophet says, be like the birds. When he says be like the birds is you rely on the rizq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know that it's coming. And the birds go and they come back and they're not afraid because they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rizq is coming. And I like to connect that with, I tell sometimes some of my clients, make a ritual every morning to feed the birds. Get a bird feeder. Get all kinds of, you know, peanuts and sunflower seeds and all kinds of things. And go and make it a ritual where you're feeding the birds. Make yourself a cup of tea and watch the birds and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends them to your feeders. And, it, and for many people, it's very therapeutic. And I'm using that as an example, as another way to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just to recap, help them connect. Uh, first, again, embrace, embrace what is, connect with that feeling, have a conversation, honor that person by having that visualization and talking to that person that they lost or are losing. And then third is having this continual um connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you can continue the conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him for his help. Jazakumullah khair, sister Dua. That was our last question. Um, does anyone have any other questions they'd like to ask sister Dua? I like what Rania put in the chat about imagine the, the reality that Allah promised. Yes. Absolutely. And the Prophet ﷺ does that, right? He gives us these rea these alternate realities to help us visualize what it might be like. There is a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran describes the details of Jannah, right? And describes the details of hellfire. Now we know why he does that, right? Because it, it is a, such a powerful tool for us as human beings to, to have that visualization response. Thank you so much, Sister Zara, for today. Um, I, 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 I can imagine I'm speaking for everyone when I say that this was definitely very eye-opening um, and very, it felt very healing for me. And I can imagine that goes uh, for a lot of people here. So Jazakumullah khair. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you and give you the strength and the forbearance to do the job that you do because we are in a very special place. Allah has blessed us really, really. Allah has blessed us to be the healers of this particular space, right? Because people need us. They need us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through you, through you, you are kind of like a tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through you, and that healing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you serve others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be in the service of you, you know? So you're in a very special place. You're very blessed. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to give you that strength and um, forbearance inshallah and give you baraka um, and blessings in the time that you put into healing others amen 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 jazakumullah khid everyone for joining inshallah we plan to upload this onto youtube and then you know for those of you who registered which i imagine you all did if you're here um we'll be sending you out the link so you have this recording as well as any other resources that were shared during the session inshallah and so we are planning to have another meet the expert in december so be on the lookout inshallah for that announcement soon jazakumullah khair uh, jazakumullah. Sister, did you have anything you wanted to share no i just remembered because uh of re in terms of resources i think ruh um has a template um, they have a really good template of like a healing circle, like example. Um, I think Sister um, Hina Mirza came up with a really cool acronym called HEAL. And it stands for hope in your healing circle. You want to make sure that you're emanating hope, empowerment, um, action, and listening. So um, I think it's accessible for everybody. If if you want to take a look at it, it's it's a, it's a it's an excellent um, resource as well. 
Jazakum Allah khair. I hope you all have a blessed night, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Shadu Allah ilaha illa anta sawfiqa wa tubu ilaika.